So welcome back. This time we're going to be talking about generating reports and web apps. That means we are really diving headfirst into the true kind of data science material. This is not something that your typical social scientist really worries about yet. Uh, I do think it's, however, a very important skill set to have because what it essentially enables you to do is help other people access and play with data that you have already analyzed. Not in a uh, not in quite a, st a static a way as uh, as you can as you do with like reports or writing up papers, but instead to actually create interactivity. Uh, and we'll actually explore both sides of that. We will explore how to create PDFs automatically based on your uh, analyses, which is is useful because it it's uh, you know a nice permanent archive in PDF form of what you've done. But also the interactive side, how to actually build an app that somebody can play with. Um, we're going to cover a couple of different topics in doing so. First, I'm going to talk about how to actually install the software to do any of this. Um, I'm going to then walk you through the platform called Markdown, which is um, essentially a new language. It's a kind of a new programming language that you need to learn. Uh, well, not exactly programming, but a new language that you need to learn uh, in order to make these kind of uh, apps and reports. I also talk about markup languages in general. Markup languages are really the the foundations of the internet. Everything that you see is in a markup language uh, called HTML uh, when you look at web pages. So we're going to talk about what the, all that means a little bit. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a preview of next week when we talk about uh, or the next module when we talk about web scraping and pulling data down from the internet. And you need to actually understand what the internet is in order to pull data down from it. Um, finally, we're going to talk a, 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 a good amount of time talk about Shiny in particular. Because um, what Shiny is, is essentially an ecosystem uh, that enables you to actually put these apps on the web. So how do you actually get from I have R code on my own computer to here is a web application that other people can access. So we'll, we'll go kind of start to finish on how you would actually create an app uh, and go through kind of an example of doing so. So one of the things about this is that we're now moving outside of R again. So we've, we've been using R, we've been downloading packages for R, but we actually need brand new software in order to do uh, the kind of exporting that we're going to be talking about. So within R, you need R Markdown, Shiny, Knitter, and GGViz to, to be able to do the things we're going to talk about today. Um, you're not going to need GGViz a lot, but the others are very important. Um, because that's they essentially are interfaces between R and the platforms that they reference. So uh, Knitter, for example, is a platform that actually connects R to a piece of software called Pandoc uh, and uh, another piece of software called MicTech or a, a, a LaTeX type uh, program and enables them all to talk to each other. And that talking to each other is really important. The software that you need to install to actually, uh, you know, so that R has something to talk to is listed here. One is uh, some kind of LaTeX editor or converter. Uh, I would recommend that you click on that link right there. If you have, um, if you have a Windows machine, MicTech is kind of the most common. Uh, MacTech is common for the Mac, but there are actually a whole bunch of different packages you can use for LaTeX. Um, what LaTeX is is essentially a yet another language that is used to uh, do typesetting. So if you've ever seen a, uh, there's a number of uh, uh, like preprint servers or archive servers where you see people have posted versions of their uh, publications that are preprints, that kind of thing. And they all have a very particular font. You'll know what I mean when you see it, if you've seen one of these before. There's a very particular way that people write uh, their articles in plain text and then convert it into a PDF. That system is called LaTeX. Uh, so part of what uh, Markdown is, is that you actually write in Markdown, which is very easy, um, that converts your R into Markdown code, and then the Pandoc software will convert the Markdown code into LaTeX code. So you don't ever actually have to learn LaTeX, but you still need to have LaTeX in order to create the PDFs and apps and other things we're going to talk about today. Um, the the uh, program that you really need, uh, especially need here, is called Pandoc. That's that second link, and you need to install that too. Um, and what Pandoc is, is essentially a document converter uh, where you can convert between all sorts of different formats, between LaTeX and PDFs and Word documents and basically whatever you want, as long as you have software that can read those original formats that you're converting to and from. That's easy on the R side because R code and uh, Markdown code, it's just plain text. There's no, there's actually nothing special about it. But especially if you're trying to convert to like a Word document or a PDF, then you need something that can write Word documents or PDFs. So those, uh, and if you want to actually, that means if you want to write to a Word document, you also need Word. So installing all that software will enable you to make all these various conversions that we're going to be talking about. 
Um, you could theoretically use R Markdown uh, from the command line. You could use it directly. You can actually use it as a converter. So you can write plain text documents in Markdown, and you can send them to a command line converter, and you can turn it into a PDF. That is way harder than anything we're going to do. We're going to stick to our studio because our studio provides a very convenient interface to do a lot of this kind of work. Um, so we're really going to fo focus there. What you need to do for now, though, is make sure that you have all those packages installed, R Markdown, Shiny, and Knitter, at least, and also that you've installed the LaTeX software, the Pandoc software, and if you want to use, uh, if you want to export to Word documents, that you also have Word installed on the system that you're, you know, messing with right now. Um, that will enable you to follow along everything we're talking about. So, as I mentioned before, uh, Markdown is a markup language. It's a specific kind of markup language. So it's useful to kind of talk about what markup is in general. So what a markup language does is it takes plain text and it annotates it in order to provide some kind of metadata, like information about what you're talking about, directly into a manuscript. So the term markup actually comes from uh, an old concept where you would have... Uh, uh, if, if, you, if you went to high school like 20 years ago, this will be familiar to you, uh, where when you would have a piece of text and people would mark little symbols in it to indicate what they wanted to change about it, like you'd use a little caret sign to say, oh, you should insert a word here, or you'd underline something, uh, or you would circle something, or you strike through, you'd like mark, mark something through the text. Well, th that's a kind of markup. It's this, literally the idea of taking existing text and then writing on it or writing on top of it to provide extra information. So in the case of like text revision, you would do that to say like, oh, you need to insert a new word here or oh, you should delete this section or, or something like that. In the case of uh, markup languages, it's a little more complex the way they appear now. It's doing things like bold or underline or how do I make a link appear on a web page. All of that's done with markup. So you actually write the web page itself in plain text, but you have to mark it up in some way. Now, the difference, of course, is that when you do this on paper, you can mark in another color or you can put in margins. And we don't have that option in plain text. So we have to figure out a way to create markup without changing without sacrificing the content itself. So that's that's what markup really is. The most common markup language that you have seen many examples of, though you've maybe never looked under the hood at it, is HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. See the markups right in the name. Uh, HTML is the language of the web. Every web page is actually just plain text, but there's all sorts of code written around that plain text to explain what things are. Uh, and we'll see some examples of that in a minute. LaTeX, I've already mentioned, it's really the most common type of uh, markup language used for scientific publication. In natural sciences, it is way more common. Uh, if you ever have tried to publish anything in an interdisciplinary journal that has a lot of um, uh, that has a lot of natural scientists, so if you've ever tried to publish in like a uh, PNAS or a Science or Nature or any of those kind of places, uh, you'll notice they take LaTeX documents, and that's because that is so common in the natural sciences because LaTeX actually makes it a ridiculous amount easier to make sure that all of your exact formulas and little symbols look exactly the way you want to. Uh, it's standardized so that one a LaTeX document in one place will look the same no matter whose computer you're looking at. You don't have to deal with like file conversions and, oh, do you have Word installed? Like none of that. It's plain text, so it's universal. So it's very attractive in that, in that kind of environment. Uh, Markdown, which is the one we're going to talk about, is a markup language designed specifically for uh, making HTML easier. So most people, when they write uh, HTML, uh, if you write it for a real web page, you have to do things like insert links, you have to say where boxes are and how to have tables look, and you have to position things all over the web page. And for just an ordinary document, that's way overkill, the kind of thing that we need. We just basically need to be, have a way to say, like, I want that word bold. How do I do that? So we use uh, Markdown, which is kind of a simplified version of HTML. It has a lot of the same features, but it's just a little bit easier to, to read. Uh, the advantage of Markdown, then, is that you can actually go from a Markdown document and convert it up into HTML or into LaTeX. So that means it's easy to take one Markdown document and export it to be on the web or to be in a PDF file or to be in a Word document or whatever, and you only have to write that file one time. There's no, like, you know, select all, copy, paste, and try to, like, fix everything. That's unnecessary when you use a markup language. They're, again, universal. Um, this is what you might call uh, uh, a what you see is what you mean, sometimes called WYSIWYM. Uh, and that means that you're using plain text to convey information. Uh, universally accessible, really great because of that, will never be obsolete. Uh, no matter what happens with computers, plain text will always, at least for the next many decades, will remain the foundation of how information is 
converted or is uh, uh, sent between sources and destinations using computers. So plain text, easy to use. Um, the disadvantage of using a WYSIWYM editor is that it can be hard to read, especially when you get into like HTML and full-blown LaTeX. Uh, some of that can be where, I mean, you really have to stare at it to try to decipher what's going on. Um, instead, people don't people don't really like that. Uh, instead, they use what are called WYSIWYG editors. What you see is what you get. And that's like a Microsoft Word, where instead of saying, for this text, make it bold, and you write some code to indicate bold, you just highlight it and hit, you know, Control B, or you click on bold, and it's bold. So that's, that's the difference. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you mean. WYSIWYG, WYSIWYM. So a WYSIWYG editor, the downside is you don't really know what's actually happening under the hood. Like, when you hit bold somewhere there is a plain text document that's changing, but you don't know what it is and you don't know what it looks like and you don't know how it's coded and you don't know what's underneath the hood, so to speak. And the downside of that then is that if someone doesn't have Word, they probably can't open that file. Uh, and if they can open that file, it might look a little different than it did in your Word. So this is one of the big disadvantages of WYSIWYG, but the advantage is that usability side, uh, that you can read it. So we use WYSIWYM, and we use uh, Markdown and LaTeX and so on. It's very com common in the computer space, data science space, because of that transportability. People are willing to sacrifice a little usability in exchange for knowing exactly what they've written. So let me give you an example of a markup. So this is an example of an HTML document on the left, uh, and then what it would look like in a web browser on the right. So on the left, you can see content. Like if, I, if you compare them, you'll see the words a header on both the left side and the right side. But on the right side, in the web browser, it, it is just a header, and it says the word a header, whereas on the other side, it's wrapped in all of this other extra information. This extra information that you're seeing in HTML, are, these are called tags. What a tag is, is you take a less than sign and a greater than sign, and you put a word in the middle. So you'll see that a header is surrounded by a tag called H1, which stands for level one heading. So hopefully you're seeing now a little bit what markup means. Like the text is still there. We just surrounded it in an open H1 and a close H1 tag. And it's closed because it has that slash in it. Uh, and that tells us, oh, the word a header should be a header. It should be a level one heading specifically. Uh, all HTML has this kind of basic structure under the hood. And you'll see a couple of common things. The entire thing is surrounded by something called HTML. You'll see the HTML tag and the close. Uh, you actually can't see the close HTML, but there would be a closed HTML tag at the very bottom. You can see an open and close head tag, which stands for header. That's essentially behind the scenes information that you don't want the person looking at the web page to see, but is important to include. And then you see an open and close body tag, which contains everything that actually goes in the web page. And the details of HTML are not super important right now, but what is worth remembering is that this is what markup is. This is this idea of you take your plain text, you put it in a document, and then you surround it with other information in order to, um, in order to convey extra information about it, what we would call metadata. So just looking at this, without even looking at the, the web page on the right, I can look at this and say, oh, a header is a level one header. The words, a list with three items should appear in a paragraph by themselves. And then Mo, Larry, and Curly appear in an unordered list, that's U-L, and each of those is a list item, that's L-I, uh, and each one will appear with a little circle, that's the list style type. So you can see all of that information is kind of encoded in the markup, uh, even though you don't see it when you look at the web page. So that's, that's as much detail as we really need right now. Um, we'll come back to HTML next time, uh, or next week, when we get into web scraping. Um, but for now, this is kind of the, you know, this is the basic structure of how, uh, how markup works. You can see how it gets a little more complicated and a little easier when you add markdown to the mix. These are three examples of text using, one use, the one on the left uses markdown, the one in the middle uses HTML, that same thing I just showed you, and the one on the right shows what you actually see in the browser. Now you'll notice when you look at the HTML, those tags are everywhere. You have H1, close H1, open H2, close H2, open H3, close H3, which stand for level one, level two, and level three headings. Uh, P's are the paragraphs that I mentioned before. You'll see EM to indicate emphasis, which is, shows up as italics in a web browser. You'll see strong, which shows up as bold. You'll see HR slashed indicate a horizontal line or horizontal rule. Um, and you see the unordered list and ordered list that I just mentioned on the last slide. So all that's there, but there's a lot of text. Like, that, that requires a lot of extra little symbols everywhere. 
Compare that to the left side, and that's, that's Markdown. And you'll see that to create a heading, we actually use something we already use in R. We use just a simple hash. So that heading is surrounded by a lot less extra stuff in the Markdown version than it is in the HTML version. You can see the level two heading is just two hashes in a row. The level three is just three hashes in a row. And paragraphs are just words. If you add it a blank line, it automatically knows, oh, you meant to put a paragraph there, which is actually not how HTML works. HTML ignores new lines. It ignores spaces. Everything is, is just essentially one big line of text. Uh, you can see below that you have italics indicated by putting an underscore on either side of the word. You have bold indicated by putting two underscores on either side of the word. Uh, horizontal rule is just by doing dash 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 and bullet lists are a very intuitive way to, are very intuitive you just put the little stars and you've probably done this before in word if you've ever tried to create a bulleted list the easiest way is to enter star and press space bar and it will just convert it into a bullet for you so markdown is the same way it knows when you write those asterisks that what you really mean is you want a bullet list so all three of these are identical that markdown will convert into html if you want it to uh, and that HTML will look like it does on the right side without you actually ever having to write HTML in someone's web browser. So the core then about Markdown is understanding what signals there are available. So I already gave you quite a few. I gave you heading levels, I gave you italics, I gave you bold, and so on. There's a whole bunch of different random things you can do. And frankly, as you need them and as you want them, you will learn more and you will become more comfortable with them. Right now, frankly, the only things that you really need to know are basic headings, basic paragraphs, and bold and italics. That's, you know, almost everything that you'll need when trying to convert a uh, convert an R script into, uh, into a web app. Uh, frankly, you don't really need much more until you get into really kind of advanced stuff. Uh, I have two links here which are worth looking at. One is a cheat sheet uh, provided by RStudio, which basically just is this thing that you're looking at right now on this slide. Um, the other is the official guide given by RStudio um, for, uh, for our, their R Markdown reference guide. So both of those great resources, but this page gives you basically everything you need to know. On the left side, you see the text, and on the right side, you see how it appears. So you can see how headers look, you can see how pictures look if you want them, you can see how ordered lists work, and so on, and uh, exactly how to create them all. Now, where you get the power out of... Um, out of Markdown with R is that you can also execute code using R in line. Uh, so what that means is that you can actually craft a document and you can put Markdown inside it uh, and then you can add in places to execute R code in different chunks. So say for example every time that you run this script you want the current date to appear you can enter R code to display the current date every single time. So every time you run it, it will redisplay with today's date. And that seems like such a minor thing, but when you start moving this into uh, like a production environment, say you're actually working on a job, you have an alt-act career or whatever it might be, or you're at an industry uh, where you are, you know, producing one report every month based on, you know, maybe you work in administration and you are looking at how enrollments are changing and you want every month, you need a new report on, on uh, how many people have dropped courses so you can track these things over time. You can have R automatically just put the fresh data on there every single time without you having to think Think about it. So it's little things like that that uh, give you a lot of flexibility. It also means that you don't have to rewrite the code you've already written if you want to convert it into a PDF or a Word document or an app. You can just use the code that you already have. So one of those uh, you can see right now, which is the uh, backtick code here, backtick. Uh, let me show you how to actually run that. Let's go into our studio. I have the uh, kind of bones of a project right here already, uh, and you can see where I have uh, the kind of our standard folder structure already. Um, but when you do work in uh, with Markdown, what I would really strongly recommend is creating a new folder called Markdown uh, in which to do all of this work. The reason for that is that Markdown will create a lot of extra files as it does all these conversions. So you'll end up with a lot of extra things that you didn't, necessarily want in your main directories. So if you put it in like your R subdirectory, it's going to uh, get a little confusing and you'll see what I mean in a minute. So I'm gonna go ahead in the R markdown and then I'm gonna create a new file and you're gonna see I go to new file R markdown. Don't go to shiny web app ever. Even if you're making a shiny app, don't go there. That'll be more relevant later. If I click R markdown, I can give a, I can give a uh, name of my R markdown file. Let's call this sample markdown. 
Uh, let's start with HTML. That's fine. I hit OK. And you'll see you get this kind of starter piece of code. I'm going to go ahead and save this in my markdown folder. Uh, and we're going to call it, uh, what do we already call it? We're going to call it sample markdown. And that is going to be, and you can see it's appeared over here, uh, that is going to carry an RMD extension. So this is a little bit different than what you did in DataCamp because in DataCamp you didn't have to deal with the uh, RStudio interface. So this is adding a little bit beyond what you've probably already done. But you'll, I think you'll see it's not really all that much uh, more. So as soon as we are in Markdown at this point, we can go ahead and convert this into anything we want to convert it into. Uh, you can also see what it will convert into in this output piece. We're going to come back to that in a little bit later. If I hit knit right now, you will see that what happens is it automatically loads Pandoc. Uh, if, I'm going to go back over here so you can see it real quick. It uh, automatically converts the Markdown, which is what is in this document right here, into a format that Pandoc can read. And then Pandoc converted it into uh, HTML. So if I click back over, this is what it created. This is actually an HTML file that I am viewing in a web browser inside RStudio. In fact, I can go ahead and click open a web browser, and here I am in Chrome, and you can even see the same thing. So let's look at this side by side for a little bit just to see what has happened. So right here, we have a backtick, 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 our cars. Um, all that cars does is tells it the name of the chunk uh, uh, that you are talking about in, in Markdown. Not really important yet. But what this means is that everything between this first line and the second line is going to be executed. Now, if we go back over here, you can actually see what's happened. We see the word summary cars because it ran that command, but then we see the output from it immediately afterward. So that's, that's kind of the power of this, is that you can actually just run code within text in order to create these kind of reports. You can also see how different things have happened. This, remember, is a level two heading because there's two hashes. And that's turned into this line of larger size text. This is just plain text right here, and there's a link in the middle. And that just appears as a link. And you can see this text as well. When we look over here, you can see, oh, that knit looks like it's bolded. So I bet they did something special in the markdown. And yes, they did. There's a star, 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 star on either side of the word knit. So hopefully you can see really simply that you can just change little things about the markdown in order to change the, uh, the outcome. So say, for example, I put my underscore underscore on either side of simple and I hit re-knit. It's going to take a little bit to, uh, to recode it, and then it's going to reappear. And you can see now the word simple has appeared in bold. That's it. That's Markdown. Uh, we can go back to any of our other formats that we saw in our file before, like single stars. Uh, if, kind of a pop quiz if you remember what single stars do. And there it is right there. It's, um, uh, it is just uh, italics. And you can actually see the HTML this is generated. If you go into your browser, right click, and go to view page source, you can actually see the raw HTML that this generated, uh, which you can see is there's a little bit that looks like what we talked about. There's our head. Uh, here's our HTML tag, our head tag. Then there's all this other code stuff in here. Don't even know what that is. Not real important because Knitter took it took it uh, uh, Knitter took control for us so that we didn't need to worry about actually coding any HTML. But if we scroll through, eventually you'll see up ah, there's that body tag I told you was in all HTML. Um, and then here's some headers and here's some paragraphs and so on. So it just directly converted over uh, everything that we needed into uh, HTML, but we didn't have to write any of that HTML to do it. All I did was add two asterisks to make something italics, whereas if I was writing HTML, that would be a little bit more complicated. So that's, that's the advantage here. Uh, let me briefly show you an example of inline text. Uh, let's say today's date is blank. Uh, and then I can enter R and then enter some code here to execute. So let's test down in our console what we want it to look like. So I probably want to use something like sys, uh, oops, not date, sys dot, oh, capital date. There we go. So we see that we get this format with sys date. So let's just add that in, sys date. Uh, and now let's, uh, let's run this. We're going to knit. It's going to create our HTML file, send it to Pandoc, all automatic. And you can see right there, the date has automatically been entered in uh, where I wrote that little code chunk. So again, this is the advantage. It just allows you to kind of freely uh, uh, you know, slide back and forth between just writing text and writing code. And that's, that's the advantage of this whole system. 
So I already showed you the two examples of what you can do uh, with this. One, we have uh, the inline text with the uh, single tick and the letter R. The reason there's an R there is because you can actually use Markdown to display multiple programming languages. Like if you decide at one point to learn Python, you can mix R and Python code in one document. We're never going to do that. So you're always going to just have an R there. Uh, at least in here, in order to look at, in order to insert code in line. In the other case, if you want to insert it as a block, then you're going to use the tick, tick, tick. Now, one of the things to notice is that when I did the single ticks, my text, the thing I typed, that sys.date, did not appear in the document. However, when I had that summary statement within a block, it did. That's because by default, the single tick R has what's called it has a property called echo, and that echo property is false. And what echo does is it displays the original code over again. So by default, inline R has echo set to false, and this kind of R, uh, the block code, has echo set to true. But you can change it. You can actually alter that code freely, and you can see some of the options right here. So if I want to add in the uh, the echo command here, I can just go to the end, and again, cars is just the name of the R chunk, and I can do uh, comma echo equals false. And then when I re-knit this, uh, it is going to uh, automatically say, well, I'm not going to display it again. So now, remember before, we saw the word summary parentheses cars in the HTML. Now that is, uh, now that's gone. And instead, we just have the uh, output coming from that. So this, this really allows you kind of a fine-tuned control over exactly what does and does not appear based on each code chunk. Uh, so you can see echo is one of them. The name is another. Uh, if you have names plus traits, it is important that you always have the name first and then commas. Uh, alternatively, if I didn't care about its name, I could uh, just put a comma like that. That would work just fine. Um, you will only need names in certain circumstances. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so if you don't need a name, there's no reason to name it. You can just do R comma. But the important piece is that if there is a name, it's R space name. And then the comma always comes after that, whatever that happens to be. Uh, so we can have echo. So echo true displays code. Echo false does not display it. Uh, message warning and error displays messages, warnings, and errors. Those are just your kind of standard R things that come out of when you run text. Eval equals true or eval equals false tells you to run or not run the code. That's useful if you just want to display code but you don't, and you want it to be formatted like code in the HTML file, but you don't actually want to run it. So you might put eval equals false for that. Um, then you have results equals markup, uh, and that tells whether or not you want the chunk that you're editing the traits to to actually display at all or not. Because you might want it to run but not display, or you might want it to... Uh, do a variety of other things. So there's there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, if you need something like that, you can look it up later. Um, here's an example down below of, of a, a block, a chunk called my code with echo set to false. So you just have tick, 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 r, my code, comma, echo equals false. And then I assign a value of my bar to a uh, value of one to a variable called my bar. Uh, every markdown file at the top has what's called a YAML header. Uh, Y-A-M-L, has the same format every time. If we cut back over to uh, R, you will see this. We have a title, author, date, and output. Those ended up when I ran it, and I will just re-knit it uh, right now so that you can see what that ends up looking like. Um, that just comes out as a level one header and a level, I think, three or four header for the uh, author and date. The most important, so it's just text, that the most important piece of this is going to be this output one, which changes how it outputs. HTML documents just one thing you can make, but watch how easily I can convert this whole thing into a PDF just by saying PDF underscore document instead of HTML underscore document. This one's going to take a little bit longer because the PDF uh, knitter is a little more complicated, but here we go. And you can see that now I've created this same thing that I was just looking at. Here is my output, and here are the plots that it contains all immediately in uh, just by changing literally four characters from HTML to PDF. So this really gives you a lot of kind of, this also, this specific part of the YAML header gives you a lot of control over exactly what gets outputted and why. Uh, a lot of different things that can go there. I mentioned, I showed you PDF, I showed you HTML. You can also put Word underscore document there if you want to end up with a Word document on the other end. Uh, there's also three types of uh, uh, presentations, Beamer, Slidey, and IO Slides. Each of those are intended for, to create slideshows on the basis of your markdown code. If you do that, you also want to do things like 
specify where slide breaks are. There's a lot of little extra things you need to do, um, but it's important to realize that's there. So if you, for example, every three months or every six months, you need to give a presentation using the same data every single time, it's really easy just to automatically generate you know, a handful of slides that you can just copy paste into something else if that ends up being something you need to do a lot. Remember uh, last time I, I talked to you a little bit about how you write functions whenever you need to repeat something more than you know maybe two or three times. Um, you don't want to repeat code. Same thing is true here. You don't want to repeat effort. If you've already written the code to generate a report once and you just need to generate that same report multiple times, don't keep regenerating it. Generalize out and write code that will generate your report for you without having to do anything uh, other than you know hit run again. That's that's really kind of the ideal kind of data science mindset. Uh, you don't want to replicate effort. I also have an output type called MD document. Uh, what that essentially allows you to do is output a new markdown file on the basis of your first markdown file. Uh, you might ask, why would you need to do that? That seems kind of odd. And the answer is that if you're doing some really advanced uh, advanced markdown creation, like say you're creating templates of markdown for other people, or you're creating standard ways of doing markdown uh, that you're going to pass on to others, then you might use something like that. Uh, probably not something that you'll use anytime soon, but just, you know, you should be aware of it in case, uh, in case something like that comes up. A lot of extended YAML options to give you a lot of control over what exactly comes out on the other side. Uh, YAML is a little weird in that indention and tabs matter. Um, there, the other programming languages are like that, but R is not. R doesn't care if you indent or not. Uh, YAML does. So if you add extra spaces, then it will get confused. Um, HTML is the most flexible output format, and HTML comes with a whole lot of other things you can do with it. Um, again, there's this uh, reference guide that our studio has, so click on that link if you want some more detail about it. Um, but here's an example where you see output HTML document colon and then a theme numbered sections table of contents and a floating table of contents all added in so let's try adding some of that in number one note I can't keep HTML document on the same line like look here in my example I have a new line and HTML document has a colon after it if you leave it here and you put a colon it is not going to work so instead we have to go to the next line and we have to hit tab to go to the next next piece let me do uh, first, let's try this, theme casino. Uh, oh, and I need a space. There we go. And let's just see how that changed the document you know, by itself. What did a casino theme do exactly? Um, oh, and casino is actually not even uh, possible right now. So you got a list down at the bottom as to what the possible themes are. Let's do journal theme. No, nah, that won't be exciting. Let's do space lab theme. That sounds fun. Uh, we'll see. Uh, journal theme is probably going to look good, so I want to purposely make it so it's more obvious what's changed. Oh, actually, the font has changed a little bit. This actually looks pretty good. Um, the font is a little bit uh, smaller. The colors are a little bit softer. Uh, this actually looks like a pretty dark gray instead of a black, so a few little things have changed. Uh, if we change uh, to another type instead of... Uh, oh, can't see what they even are. I think there was a cerulean. Let's try that. Um... And what I'm really just kind of demonstrating here is how easy it is to change, yeah, here's a Cerulean format, how easy it is to change some of the basic functioning of, uh, or the basic uh, aesthetics of the documents that you end up exporting. So here you can see I did a Cerulean and everything is now a little bit blue, a little bit, a little bit softer. And you can set all that yourself, but these theme options just give you a kind of a, a faster way to get about it. So let's uh, go ahead and go back to Space Lab. Um, let's do numbered sections. Uh, equals true and table of contents true and table of contents float is true too and let's see what this does uh, numbered sections I'm not sure will work with HTML actually because we don't usually have oh we do right there so you can see that the two headings uh, are marked down and including plots which here are specified as level two headings which is important have appeared as section 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 and I can click on those to actually jump up and down in my document to where they go you can then imagine, well, oh, if I wanted to have a section one and section two, I probably need level one headings. So let me adjust those real quick and re-knit. Uh, and you're going to see that change in the floating table of contents. Yep, and now we have a section one and a section two. Uh, so that number of sections, you'll note, also added in the one and the two next to our, our markdown and including plots, which I didn't have over here. Say, for example, including plots is actually a subsection of one. I bet you can guess what will happen if I, if I knit right now. I should end up with a section one and a section 1.1, uh, uh, I believe. 
uh, based on the way that I specified it. Yep, and you can even see that it has been indented in the floating table of contents. So that's an awful lot of flexibility for a very small amount of writing. Uh, and that, again, just really illustrates kind of the flexibility of our markdown. Uh, you are really given a lot of options in terms of very pretty exports. It's almost like ggplot all over again, right? You have this general purpose framework, and you can make really nice looking output on a relatively little effort. Um, I find this especially useful when trying to get out, uh, trying to get examples from coworkers or uh, from graduate students that work, in, that work with me or basically anybody else that's running an analysis and needs to step me through what they did. This is a real great way to sort of catalog step-by-step step how you did your analysis. And you can just easily show it off to someone, or you can even, even email it to someone. You can email them the web page so they can go check it out themselves. Just an enormous amount of flexibility in terms of displaying, uh, displaying uh, analytic steps and their results. Uh, most flexibility with display will come from creating what's called a CSS file. That stands for Cascading Style Sheet. And what CSS files are is uh, it's essentially a secondary markup language that operates on top of HTML. What HTML does is it marks up the content directly in that you might specify, you know, you saw some of them. You saw a paragraph. You saw strong. You saw a heading. But that doesn't tell you, like, what those look like. It just tells you kind of their function in the document. You just say, this is a heading. But you don't specify, well, I want my heading to be bold and a size 16 font, and I want to look like this and this and this. That's what CSS is for. CSS is more technically a style language. It's, it's not really markup because you don't actually apply it directly to the text that you want to change. You instead write a new document, and that has a totally different format and a different type of code in order to provide stylistic kind of formatting data to whatever it is you want to style. Uh, so CSS is a, a, new, a new thing to learn. Uh, frankly, for us, it's usually not that important unless you're going to do what I would call production quality apps. So if you want to display, if you want to deploy your app to you know a thousand people, or if you want to use it in a study, and it's important that it looks a specific kind of way, like those kind of things. If the aesthetics matter a lot, then it might be worthwhile for you to learn CSS. Um, CSS is really the backbone of style on the web. Every web page you see has CSS these days, all of them. And the CSS specifies, you know, where what looks bold, what looks this color, what looks that color. So if you need that kind of control, then I would recommend learning CSS. I'm not going to teach you CSS. Instead, you might want to look at the link given here to Code Academy, which is a, a completely free uh, online resource, and they will teach you the basics of CSS pretty quickly. Um, it's not that hard. Um, Generally speaking, what becomes hard is if you're trying to do something complicated. If you, like in your head, you say, I want to have a box here, and I want to have another box here, and when I scroll, I want this box to move and this other box not to move, and I want these to be overlapped. And this, like, once you get to that level of specificity, it starts to get kind of tricky. Um, but for your basic, I want this to be blue. That's very easy in CSS. So if that's of interest to you, then definitely check it out. You can see how HTML and CSS work together on this slide. The HTML on the left side and the things on the right side, you can see that the CSS for body says background color hash EB, EB, EB. And we've talked about colors before. That's in hexadecimal. That's really just kind of a gray, uh, a mostly white gray. So it's a pretty, pretty light color. Um, and that, that CSS causes the, ba the background of body, which is the entire web page, to appear gray. So the entire, you, but that basically means is that everything inside body is going to be rendered with a gray background, right? H1 says font weight bold, font size 24 PT, which stands for point. So that means a 24 point bold font, all the headings will now have that font. And the P, it says font style italic. So that means that everything rendered inside a P, which on the left side you can see is the text, this is my web page, will be rendered as italics. That's it. That's the basics of CSS. There, there are a lot of commands, though. Like, this is just to, shows you bold font size, italic, and background color, but there are literally hundreds of settings. So again, if you want to learn detail about that, really check out that Codem Academy page. I mean, it's, it's going to introduce you to the whole set of things that you can do. But I hope this shows you not really that hard when it really comes down to it. It's just knowing the words, knowing the language that you need. Um, for creating PDFs, I've already showed you how to create a PDF. It's just like you saw in Data Camp, just like you saw a minute ago also. Um, the things that are difficult, for, d different from what we normally do, if you're just converting your, your uh, existing project over to Markdown, you need to, one, move that over in a new version into the Markdown directory uh, for the reasons I talked about earlier. 
Um, if we can look here, like I've already created several additional files, and I don't know if you noticed, but when you click knit, um, some temporary files will be created right here as well. So all sorts of things are being generated and deleted all the time in the Markdown directory. So I just get nervous when that's inside my R directory because I just I just nervous about it. So I would really recommend having your own directory. Um, one thing to remember though is you don't run R Studio API code. If you've been following the course to this point, you'll notice that I always at the top of all of my main R files put in library R Studio API uh, and uh, then do a set working directory command to set the project directory to where the R files are located. You can't do that inside a markdown file. Um, or rather you can, but when you get to apps, that doesn't work for reasons we'll get to uh, in a minute and in the project. Um, when you develop a web app, what you are essentially doing is creating a, a piece of code that someone else is going to run on their computer somewhere. So there's no RStudio when it runs, so there's no RStudio API to interact with. There's, there's no RStudio at all. Uh, instead, it's running as a standalone app, so there's no reason to use RStudio in that context. We'll, we'll step through that ex as an example in a bit. All right. So we've looked at uh, we've looked at HTML. We have looked at PDFs. All pretty easy. Apps are a little harder because, again, you're not just creating a file on your computer. You're essentially creating a template that you're going to use to display an interactive bit of R code on the internet in someone else's computer, and that adds a lot of extra steps. So what I recommend that you do is, say for example, we had already, I'm going to uh, do it down here perhaps, uh, say for example that you had already gotten a, um, a uh, data set that you liked, I'm going to in this case run, pull up the psych library, uh, and then I'm going to look at the BFI data set, I'm going to save that as my BFI gets BFI, and then I'm going to write, write underscore, whoop, like a little tidyverse real quick so that I can save this using uh, write underscore CSV. Um, I'm going to do write underscore CSV, and I'm going to write my BFI to a file called mybfi.csv. So the reason that you want to do that is that you want to have the least processing possible whenever you write an app. If every single person that uses your app is going to see the same cleaned data set, there is no reason to force R to re-clean it every single time that app is run. Instead, what you want to do is do whatever cleaning you're going to do ahead of time and then save your ready-to-be-displayed-in-the-app version of that file, and that's then what you import into, uh, that's what you import into your app. So you can see here I've already created my BFI.csv. I'm, uh, I'm actually going to open the, that folder up, and I'm going to move that into the Markdown folder so that it is there with, um, with my Markdown files. You can see there it is, my BFI underscore CSV. And now inside one of my chunks, let's say I wanted to look at, uh, let's say that I wanted to look at the mean of A1 for some reason. Uh, then what I might do in one of my chunks, so instead of uh, summary cars, I'm going to say, uh, 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 read, well, I'm going to say my BFI gets read underscore CSV, uh, my BFI dot CSV, and then I'm going to uh, print mean of my BFI. Well, I don't have to do print. I can just do mean of my BFI and then see, I don't remember which one we're going to like. Let's say the first item in agreeableness. And now when I hit knit, uh, I'm going to get a, oh, I didn't have tidyverse, man. So I'm going to have to have my library call in here as well, library tidyverse, and then I'm going to knit. And then we're going to have tidyverse load, it's going to read CSV, and then it's going to compute the mean, and that's going to get displayed in this file. You can see I ended up with all the code that you normally see when loading tidyverse, and you can see I got an NA here because there's missing values. <laughs> so if I go back into my mean command, I can do uh, NA dot... Yes, na.rm equals true. I'm going to try re one more time. And this kind of process that I'm going through of testing and going back every time, very common in app development. And you can see now we get our mean uh, nice and pretty right there. So um, that's how you would kind of create the foundations of an app, except that instead of doing this here, and I'm going to copy-paste this out and put it into a new file, uh, we're going to create a new... 
our markdown file and I'm going to show shiny shiny document sample shiny and things are going to be slightly different in this file shiny enables interactive apps I'm going to I'm going to create a new let's say we we'll put it here I'm going to create a new chunk right here I'm going to put my code into it and that there we go and then I'm going to run, uh, save this as sample shiny. And we're going to run it. And we're going to see what kind of interactivity is possible. And we're also going to see that output that I just added in. I would encourage you on your own time to just play with this. Oh. I encourage you in your own time to, uh, oh, I can't have that at all. Whoops. <laughs> Copy that over and shouldn't have. I would encourage you in your own time to play with this app and also to really carefully look back and forth between the app and the code that created it. Because this really demonstrates some of the flexibility and power of R. If you scroll down, you will actually see how you can make changes to a ggplot and it will actually show you different, uh, different output in that graph bound below as a result of the input that you made. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, what right now I want you to pay attention to is that this command that I just did, mean my BFI AI, uh, is on a file that I saved into this directory and it's reading it in real time and then uh, it is calculating that mean for me. Now you'll notice that there's all this extra, these extra pieces right here that we don't want. This is a good example of where we might say uh, messages message message equals false because we don't want to get the messages back from tidyverse that it has successfully loaded itself and you can see now i still get the code but i don't get the messages that i got before we can change it again and we can say echo equals false also and that's going to hide the code itself in case we don't want it um so real quick it's going to load and here we go so now we just get the output Okay. So hopefully you can follow how I just kind of change those settings around just to see what would happen. There's no reason you can't hit run a whole bunch of times. Um, but what's important to recognize is that what's happening here is that you're actually creating an interactive web application, and this is a web browser. And that whatever you do in the first piece is that you end up with um, kind of this interactive output in the web browser that you can kind of play around with. So, uh, so yeah, I would really recommend spending some time playing with this example. Try importing your own files. Try, try importing your own data. Try running analyses in here and then get them into the web app and see what it looks like uh, just to get a kind of a good sense of how it all works together. The one thing that I'm going to uh, particularly point out right now is how interactivity works. So you might look at this and say, well, wait a minute. How is it that our is uh, able to interpret what I'm doing and how can that be then piped over into the app? How does this graph take this input? How does the graph know what number I've selected here? And the answer is that uh, what's happening is that in this code there is something called a render plot and what a render plot is is an interactive object that you can send information into and out of. Okay. So that render plot, every time something changes on the web page, that render plot updates itself. And you can see this one, it says hist, so this is this histogram. It's the histogram right here. So this code, this actually isn't ggplot, this is just a regular old histogram. Um, every time that uh, anything changes on this page, so every time I click something, every time I move something, every time I adjust something over here, it is updating in the anything that it sees in the render plot function. So great, how does it know what I've selected? And the answer is that you create objects that have names. So here you can see select input and it's something called in breaks labeled number of bins, okay? Aha, that's this thing. So this thing is named in breaks in the code. It has choices 10, 20, 35, 50. You can see them right there. And selected is 20 because when I opened this uh, app, that was the default, that's all that means. So this is called in underscore breaks. Great. That means this other one, BW underscore adjust, is probably the other one too, right? Yeah, minimum point two, and you can see that. Max is two, you can see that too. Value equals one, so that's probably where the default was again. And step equals point two. Oh yeah, if I drag it, I can see that point two step on that slider. So these two commands essentially created two interactive objects without me having to code the HTML to actually make those things. Instead, I it, it created it for me based on what I wanted it to do 
And those two things are called in breaks and BW adjust. Now, if you look in the render plot code, you will see that there's a vector, a named vector called input that has those names. So here's input in breaks, and it's being fed as the breaks parameter of the hist function. And here's another one uh, called uh, density, and the adjust parameter is getting input bw underscore adjust. So what's happening is that every time I change something in the web browser, every time I change something here, R, R will say, aha, the number that that person chose is now the value of input dollar sign, whatever it's called. So when I click right here, what I've really done is set BW underscore adjust to 1.6. When I do this, I've set BW adjust to 0.2. When I do this, I've set BW underscore adjust to 0.8. When I do this, I have set in underscore breaks to 50. And then when it re-renders whatever's inside render plot, you end up updating all those numbers. So that now breaks equals, because I set it to 50, now breaks equals 50, or rather breaks equals as dot numeric 50, is what ends up being passed to this hist function. So it's really ultimately all about how each of these pieces talks to each other that becomes the key to app development. When you make a Shiny app, what you have to pay attention to is how is the user talking to the, to the app, and then how is the app taking that information and putting it somewhere else? That's the key to apps. To actually make one, uh, and this is kind of summarizes everything I just said, one, use write CSV on your final ready for figure data set. So we already did that with my BFI. Have your original figure generation code ready. So ideally, if you're going to use ggplot, for example, you've already made a ggplot in your R file, and you can just copy-paste that code when you need it in order to regenerate your figure. Then create a new Shiny Markdown uh, document using RStudio. Don't go to new Shiny app. I warned you a couple times about that. But again, right here, you're going to see file, new file, Shiny web app. Don't do it. It's a, it's a trap. Don't do it. Instead, go to New File, R Markdown, and select, pre and select uh, Shiny, Shiny Document. Okay. Now, after you've done that, uh, you can delete everything below YAML if you don't want it. So, like right here, all of this down below is just the example. So, if I wanted to make my own, uh, my own app, I could do so, like right here. Let's cut out this and cut out all of this. We don't need our summary cars anymore. We've just got library, tidyverse, read, mean, etc. Now, right within a code block, add shiny functions for anything you want the user to be able to change. So we just saw slider input. That's the one where you can you know, select on a slider. Uh, and we saw uh, uh, radio. There's also radio buttons where you can actually select individual radio buttons. Uh, let me show you an example of one we might use here. Let's say we wanted them to be able to choose which variable they looked at between A1 through A5. So maybe I would have a select input. So let's go down to the console and look and see what select input looks like. That's going to appear over in, uh, oh, sorry. we got to do library shiny first. forgot about that. Select input. And we can see over here we have select input, input ID, label, choices, selected, multiple, a lot of different options. Who knows what they all mean? Uh, I like to scroll down and take a look at an example. Aha. So it looks like we can just do select input, and I can call my variable var to choose or var to choose. Um, it looks like the next thing is the label. So variable you want to look at. And then the next thing is, it seems to be a vector uh, of named variables, one which contains uh, what the user sees and the other which contains what actually gets sent under the hood. So let's say we say we call this item uh, agreeableness one, and that's going to actually correspond to a one or agreeableness two, which corresponds to a two uh, or conscientiousness one, which corresponds to c one. And you can imagine how I could continue that out. I'm not going to because it would just take too much time. Uh, you also see then there's a, a table output. I don't know if that's really necessary yet. Let's just go ahead and run this and see what it does. Um, again, think of this in terms of development, just like with R. You know, keep rerunning it over and over again and see if it works. And here, yeah, it works. We have agreeableness one, agreeableness two, and conscientiousness one. Great. So let's say at this point that we wanted to do something uh, 
a little more interesting in terms of displaying the variable that you want to look at. Let's, let's instead of showing the mean, uh, let's show a histogram uh, of that variable. So let's let's start this from the beginning, and you'll see kind of the troubleshooting process that's required in order to figure out how to go from the uh, you know, kind of regular display of data into the app version of that. Um, because there's, there's a few little cognitive leaps you have to take that are not necessarily so obvious. Let's start off by writing this the way that we normally would write it with uh, ggplot my BFI. Um, and then we probably do an aesthetic with uh, x equals, um, let's actually start off with a1 just so we can make sure that we have this looking right the first time, geom histogram. Uh, so we run, we run ggplot, uh, yeah, and there we go, we have a histogram. We could, we could customize the look of that a little bit, we could change, you know, the, the aesthetics, uh, or not the aesthetics, we could change the theme, we could change the other aspects of the ggplot. For our, the sake of our example right now, I'm not going to worry about any of that. Now the, the task becomes, how do we make this ggplot into an interactive object that the value given for select input can be used to customize what appears here? There's a few steps you have to think about in order to make that happen. Step one is we're, not, we're no longer going to just have a variable. We're instead going to have a pointer to a variable that selects a variable. So that would be something like input dollar sign var to choose. But that may not work because, and we'll, we'll check it in a second, because there's no way really for uh, for shiny to know whether you actually mean that variable or whether you just need something you know named var to choose so we're, i'm going to show you what ends up happening as a result of that the other piece is that we have to turn this into the interactive object the one that we've seen so far is render plot uh the, importantly render plots a function so what you do is you do render plot open paren and then uh, you usually put in an open bracket so that you can put in whatever you want inside the, uh, the in render plot with as many lines as you want. So I just converted that ggplot into a render plot like this. When I run this, it is not going to work quite the way we would hope it to work. Um, because again, there's going to be some confusion surrounding how this variable works right here. Because we're not actually passing the value of var to choose. We're actually passing an instantiation of a virtual object to var to choose. And you see, that really confuses the crap out of Shiny. So it doesn't know how to deal with that problem. So we're actually going to change this into a slightly different format. We're going to do uh, what's called AES underscore string. Uh, and we're going to choose our uh, our var to choose uh, using that instead. I'm going to make sure my, uh, my parentheses look right. There we go. Uh, and when I do it that way, it's actually going to reconvert this variable into a new variable name. Uh, and then that conversion is going to get be what's it's going to actually generate an aesthetic automatically on the basis of the variable that I told it. And because I only gave it one, that's going to be the X variable. So uh, you can see here in our new app, I can actually change this between agreeableness uh, and conscientiousness, the three different items that I selected, and we get that full uh, histogram automatically with, again, only like three lines of code to generate this kind of interactive web application. So I, I hope that really demonstrates to you kind of the power and flexibility of uh, 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 of how you would go about this and also kind of kind of through the mental process. Like if I had just, uh, I think by default, most people would just put aesthetic and then input and you would get some errors and you'd be like, ah, I guess it just doesn't work. But you have to really think through what's happening. Um, really think of it in terms of the person's web browser is is exerting kind of a, a causal force here. It, it does certain things and expects certain things. Shiny expects certain things and R expects certain things, and they all have to talk to each other. So at any of those interfaces can be where errors are occurring. And when you want to diagnose what's going on, you have to kind of look at think about those interfaces and then fix the ones that are broken. Important part here, again, remember I had to create this dynamic virtual object using render plot. And if I go down into my console and I look at render plot, uh, you're going to see that it's all, there's a, a whole lot of different settings for it, a lot of different things you can worry about. There's a lot of different other renders too, though. There's a, a actually, if I just type it right here, shiny colon colon render. You can see we have render data table, render image, render plot, render print, render table, render text, and render UI. They all do different things. Uh, but they all only do one of them. So if you want to render plot, that really means one plot is inside your render plot. At the end of the day, no matter how much code you've got in there, and you can have as much as you want, it still has to output just one plot. Uh, similarly, render text just outputs 
text. So if that's what you want, then you should wrap everything inside uh, inside of that. What's important also to remember is that chunks in Shiny are independent. So if I go right here and I create a new R chunk, in here, my BFI is not defined because my BFI only exists inside this chunk right here. So if I want to use my BFI twice, I would need to actually put it inside the same chunk. And that can be important when you're designing the specific apps that you're, uh, that you're interested in. Uh, so again, always have some sort of render function in order to create the interactive object that is going to be changed. And then you need to create some combination of input functions. And we've got, uh, uh, like, numeric input is another. Uh, let me actually pull up the questions on that. Um, we have numeric input, uh, checkbox input, date input, password input. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and you can use these to create interactive HTML objects to allow people to select stuff. So this is the select input, the one I, select, I, I specified here. But maybe you don't want a drop down. Maybe you want checkboxes or radio buttons or whatever. Uh, all of those options are available to you inside Shiny as long as you can figure out which function creates them and then interpret the, uh, the, 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 the help file to figure out exactly what you need to pass to it. Uh, so you give it a name and then you need to get, make sure that that name gets transferred into whatever you know, piece of code in, in, inside the interactive object that you want to display a thing with. So if that's a plot, render plot, text, render text, etc. But you need to make sure you have an input device that creates something with that name so that it appears inside the input vector uh, wherever you need it to go. Um, and this is going to be a little, I'm going to uh, warn you in advance, this is a, kind of a weird thing to start thinking about. Uh, and it will make a lot more sense after you successfully create one app. If you create one app that interacts on the basis of a person's input, it will all make much more sense. Once you can do that successfully, uh, all of the little pieces will start to click together. Um, but it will take that project uh, in order to really get to that point. So again, we go back to the example, test your Shiny input code by copying each function's result into an HTML file and viewing that in a web browser to make sure it looks right. Uh, that step is, uh, is important if you're not sure that you know, this is going to actually produce what you think it's going to produce. You can run document every time if you want, but alternatively, you can actually go into console and run this and you will see the HTML that it generates right there. You can then actually just copy paste that into a file that you save as a .html. Um, like here, let's actually do an example of that real quick. Here I have Metapad, my favorite little text editor. I'm just going to paste that in. And if I hit save and I throw it to the desktop and I'm going to call it sample.html, uh, I can then go into my uh, web browser, uh, if I can find my web browser. I can go into my uh, my web browser real quick, and then I can open up that file that I just saved in Chrome. That's Control O. I can go to the desktop, and I can find that HTML file that I just made, sample that HTML, and there is my dropdown. It doesn't have the same the, the CSS is different, so it doesn't have the same look, but you can at least see that this is the correct sort of like dropdown. Uh, you can also go in here and make sure that, uh, you can even see it right here, agreeableness 1 is the part that's being displayed because it's the part that's outside of all of the tags and all the markup. So remember, anything inside a tag is the metadata, inside, outside a tag is something that gets displayed. So in this case, you can see there's a select and an option, and then outside of option we have agreeableness 1, so that's why that's what ends up appearing inside uh, inside the select box once the select box appears because that's that's that piece right there. Uh, so once you get a handle on more HTML, and again, we'll cover that more next week, this will be a little easier. Um, but for now, just keep those kind of those pieces in mind that you have an interactive object that's created with render. You have an input object that saves whatever the user does into the input vector. And the goal is to make sure that by the time you get to your render functions, that input is what it should be doing whatever steps are necessary to get to that point. Uh, read, we already did read CSV, copy existing feature generation code, and modify to use shiny variables. So I just showed you how to do that. Um, use input to refer to the variables that are created. And then finally, surround the entire figure generation code with render plot if you're creating 
a plot. Uh, if you're doing it with text, you'd want render text or whatever else you were doing, you would want that. Uh, you will notice that there is a difference between render table and render data table. Data table is actually pretty cool because it allows you, it allows the user to add filters and sorting and all sorts of interactive stuff and you don't have to code any of it. It just does it all automatically. So if you're bored, feel free to throw a, a render data table around a random data frame and you will see you really get a lot of options and a lot of power to, uh, to customize it. Um, Actually, we're just going to do it right now. So I'm going to do, just to show you, render data table, uh, and then I'm just going to show you the my BFI, and I'm going to hit run. Um, again, just like one little tiny piece of code uh, in order to, to display that. Uh, and you're going to see what it does is that we actually have this full sortable table. I can actually search for like specific numbers in that table. It's not really super informative right now because it's showing every row with a one in it anywhere. So that's all of the rows. But if you have text, especially, uh, it's really it's really useful. Um, let's see, actually, can I search for H21? Yep. So now you see that I've searched for every instance of 21. At the bottom of the table, I can even filter by specific values within specific things. So say I want to look only at people that scored a 1 on A1. I can just type that 1 there, and it's done that for me. So all of that enables interactive data exploration with literally one line of code. That is, that's kind of the, another aspect of the power of, uh, of these tools. OK, so that's your basic Shiny app. Um, there are, uh, there's then beyond that the issue of trying to get it onto the internet. Uh, and I will uh, talk about that in a little bit. One of the things that you can, uh, that you might find yourself needing, and we're not gonna talk about it a lot in here, but again, good to know it exists, uh, is the difference between just plotting and interactive animated plotting. If you, for example, wanna be able to click on something and for you know pieces of your graph to swoop over somewhere else, uh, or you wanna be able to like, you've seen those like, uh, you know, almost infographics where you click on something and it zooms in so you can see some data, it zooms out and in. Uh, where you you have this kind of interactive, very um, what we would call kind of a squishy experience, where we click on something and stuff flies around everywhere. If you want to do that kind of thing, um, and that's going to be most useful to you if you're really going to make a business out of you know sharing data with clients. Like say if you're uh, again in this kind of alt act space, you're a consultant. Like if you're an IO psychologist, you might uh, have use for that. Um, then you might want something using ggviz, which actually enables this kind of interactivity in a way that ggplot does not. ggplot is really about take data, create an output, done. And you can see even uh, in what we did, every time I click somewhere else on that uh, that drop down, what it, it went gray for a second. And the reason for that is it's literally regenerating the entire graph. If instead you want a little bit faster interaction, you want it to kind of interact with you, you don't want those delays, ggviz is the way to do that. But the downside to ggviz is one, it's an, another whole system to learn. Uh, and number two, it's actually not quite as flexible as ggplot because it, um, because it involves uh, uh, animations and the restrictions that HTML places on animations. So you actually can't do quite as much with it in as base ggplot in that you can't do quite as many like geoms or can't go quite it's not called geoms there you can't do quite as many different shapes and types of plots but you have more flexibility within the plots that you can make if that makes sense uh, you generally only want to use ggviz if you're like i want this to be animated and i want it to be springy and i want stuff to happen when i click on things and i want it to be very active and, inter and interactive constantly then you might want to turn to ggviz otherwise ggplot works just fine so if you want those animations, that's where you would turn to it. And again, we're not going to talk about it any more than that. I just want you to be aware it exists in case uh, you do need those kind of functions. All right. So what do you do if you want your app on the internet? So the easiest way to do it is to go to shinyapps.io, which is hosted by the RStudio team, uh, and create a free account. And what that free account will allow you to do is create up to five separate uh, online Shiny apps that you can literally have anybody in the world access. What it is going to charge you for is time. And you have a limited amount of total time that your apps can be used. So uh, I think that number is like 25 hours a month, maybe. And that literally means what it sounds like, where if, if a person is using your app more than 25 hours a month, or if you know 10 people use it, well, 10 is not a good number. If, <laughs> if 25 people are using it for one hour, suddenly you lose access to anybody using your apps anymore. It's literally the number of hours it's being used. Um, but for, you know, if you're just going to show it off for one or two people and for testing, it's great. 
and you can all, of course pay for the other access. I'm not sure how that's structured, but you can pay for the other uh, additional time if you want it. Uh, and if you have a, a good IT team, you can even create your own shiny server in your organization or in your university or wherever you are, um, and you can actually set it up locally so you don't even need to have access to one of these services. Um, if you do it on shinyapps.io, which I would recommend for as you learn because it's, it's just easy, um, the process is very simple. One, you sign up for a free account. Two, you have to install the RS Connect package in our studio, and that's literally again just you know go in the console and uh, uh, install it. Install you know your normal install packages, RS Connect, uh, not RAS, RS Connect. And then once you have it installed the first time, you only need to hit library. Beyond that, uh, then in ShinyApps.io, when you sign up for an account, there's going to be a point where it says. Uh, you're going to generate a secret code. Be ready to copy paste this into our studio. Do that, and as long as you follow the instructions, uh, after you've done library RS Connect in our studio, you only need to paste that in one time. It's basically credentials. It, it links your R Studio on your computer to your account on ShinyApps.io. So you do it one time, and then your your R Studio account is permanently like linked to your R Studio or your Shiny Apps account is permanently linked to your RStudio. And then at that point, it's one command, which is deploy app and then the name of the RMD file that you want to deploy. So that means after all the setup is done, all you do is library RS Connect, deploy app, and then the name of it. That's it. And then the app that you have created right here is on the internet. And you can go to your account on shinyapps.io and you can see it uh, right there. So. It actually makes it really easy to generate apps and put them on the internet. There's surprisingly uh, few steps, and if you're if you're feeling pretty comfortable with R at this point, and you play around for a few hours with Shiny, uh, you'll find that you can deploy pretty much anything you want to deploy within seconds. Uh, it's it's really very simple uh, once you have kind of the basics down. Um, but you'll definitely want to practice with it in this uh, this week's project. Common things that people run into. Uh, one is that they forget to set up access tokens in our studio. So that part about copy pasting from the website is really important because otherwise Shiny Apps has no way to know when you run deploy app that it's really you. They don't know who you are. So you have to do the access token setup part that uh, the RStudio setup page steps you through. If you forgot, if you skipped over it, if you closed the window, just go back into your Shiny Apps account and navigate through to your secret tokens and you will find the code. You can just copy paste it all over again. As long as you do it one time, you're done. So it's a common problem though, people don't notice that they forgot that. Uh, step two is for getting runtime shiny. One thing that you should notice is that I have two pieces here now. I have output HTML document because it is an HTML file, but I also have runtime shiny, which tells Pandoc, and remember that Pandoc is one of the platforms you're talking to when you're doing all of this that does document conversion. What runtime shiny does is tells Pandoc to look for those interactive elements and then link that over to kind of a, a shiny itself, to the, the interactive shiny uh, uh, program. So if you don't have runtime shiny, it won't work. Like none of the interactive pieces will work right. So make sure that's in there. Uh, so problem three, if you didn't put your skinny data file in the markdown directory, again, you don't want to have a lot of processing on the R studio, on the R side, on the markdown side. Remember, I just said you get like 25 hours a month or whatever it is uh, to you to have for people to use uh, your app. But that includes the amount of time it requires for the app to run as it runs through your code. So if you have five minutes of analyses before you get to that point, then you're using that time every time somebody loads the app, which is annoying in two ways. One, it decreases the amount of time that you have available on your account. But two, it requires the user to sit there and stare at it while it runs. So you really want to get to the final output. If you're going to do something like regression, then that means you probably don't actually want to export the raw data set. You, you might actually just want to export the, the results of augment or tidy, like those fitted values, and then just use the fitted values in the markdown file. Don't, don't include raw data if you don't need it. So it's very different than just your, your regular report generation or your regular R file. And it's really important to remember the difference between them. Uh, the next one, didn't define shiny input functions correctly. Name vectors are a real common problem. Note here that I did the name that the person sees equals the name that I want to be the value of input. If you reverse that, or if you forget it entirely and you just do this, it's not going to work. 
Because what's going to happen, like in this example, is if they select agreeableness 1, then that entire string is going to be the value of input var to choose when they choose it. And because agreeableness 1 does not exist as a variable inside my BFI, it's going to fail. So be real careful to make sure that everything is named consistently so that when they select things up here, you're getting A1 or whatever it is that you need and not something else. And remember, it's just as sensitive as R. So if this is a lowercase A1, it's not going to work. It's not the same thing. That's a common error of a problem. And I finally put too much reprocessing within render plot, although you can put as much as you want here. So for example, instead of doing agreeableness A1, agreeableness C1, et cetera, I could have just done agreeableness uh, and uh, agreeableness 2, and then conscientiousness. I could have done that. And then inside render pack, I could have said, if input var to choose equals agreeableness 1, then new var gets A1 else and so on like I could write a whole big if function to try to sense what was up there and then reprocess and refilter uh, that just adds more points of failure <laughs> those are more places for the code to run incorrectly there are more it's more uh, it's more stuff that runs on the on when the person is looking at the app versus when you're running your analyses and all of that just adds error like really just focus on what do I need for the final step if the final step is plotting then that just means you need the exact input to that plot. You don't need anything from before that point. So if you're fitting, you know, fitted values, don't have the raw data set. Don't even import the raw data set. Only import the fitted values. That becomes especially important when the data sets get big. So if you're working with kind of like big data scope things, like we'll talk about in a few weeks, if you have 10 million cases, suddenly you're requiring them to download 10 million cases every time that they run your app which is just silly. It just takes extra time, it takes extra processing, it's not necessary. So instead, you always want to export exactly what this app is going to need to display what it needs to display and nothing more. Doing anything else, just it's just going to give you a headache, so don't do it. Um, yeah, otherwise that's it. Uh, I, I hope that makes sense in terms of making apps. It's really something that I think you'll benefit a whole lot more just by playing around with it. See what you can send play around with the render functions, you know, render plot, render text, render data table, et cetera, et cetera. Play with the input functions, select and radio buttons and check boxes and everything else. And just see that, just try to figure out based on your own little internal testing, how everything works together. And that's going to help you the most in terms of preparing for this week's project.